Welcome to our Sunday morning worship service. Did you ever, ever get a phone call from a good friend and you know just as soon as you hear their voice that something's gone down that's pretty serious. They need you yesterday. And you drop everything and, and rush to whatever it is that they're in need of. Maybe it's just a listening ear. Maybe they've gone through some kind of crisis. Well, today's Bible story, we meet a man who has gone through some very serious tragedy and struggle in his life. And his best friends, despite their best efforts, know that there's something that he needs more than their loyalty and good intentions and, and stories can give. He needs God, a big God in a big way to begin to change his life around how he sees himself. If you've ever been there or you have friends that you struggle with and how to talk about God, how to share faith, how to meet them wherever they're at in their doubts, their anxieties, their disbelief, stick around as we meet Jesus and the paraplegic and his friends. Keep on rising up and looking up as we call God together and ourselves together into God's presence for our call to worship. Please join me with the words on the screen or in your bulletin. For the friends who have shaped us, God, we give you thanks. For those who have stood by us when no one else seemed to care. What value can we place on true friendship? For those who depend on us as friends, may the love of Christ be the strong foundation upon which our friendships grow. Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to invite any of the little children or anybody who's young at heart who would like to come forward, please join me as we sing Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. Jesus loves me, this I know. <laughs> Well, I appreciate having children of all ages coming up. Thank you. 
I don't even see my own here. I'm, I'm wondering, they must have slept in today, so we'll see. So today we're going to talk about, and I have some slides up on the screen. I'm going to need you to look up on the screen today because there's some slides about, I want you to tell me what is more important. So do we have some of those? Oh, here we go. Let's see who's running a little behind. Okay. So, so as we look at these pictures up here, what's more important? If you're driving a car, is it more important to wear a seatbelt or to be eating your food or to be texting on a phone? What do you think is more important? Seatbelt. Seatbelt. Yes. It's to be safe, right? Those other things you probably shouldn't be doing. Okay. Let's see which is more important on the next slide. Getting a good night's sleep, like this little guy, or studying and working till you're so tired you fall asleep at your desk. Which one do you think is more important? Getting, Get good, good, getting good sleep. Yes, yes. Those, other, those older people are not getting good sleep, are they? All right, and the next one. Which, being a good sport. When you, how many of you play a game and you say good job or thanks for playing? Versus uh, what are these people doing in the bottom there? Are they, they're punching and cheating, and they're not being very good sports, are they? So which is more important, being a good, being a good sport. sport? That's right. Okay. And the next one, let's see, we got one more. Being a good student, or what are, what are, what's happening down in this, this lower left corner? Cheating to get a good uh, He's writing all the answers, or she, he or she is writing all the answers down. They're cheating, and he's looking over at his paper. So is it more important to try and... And uh, when you take a test to do what you study for or to take somebody else's answers. Right. So, boys and girls, in the Bible stories that we're going to talk about today, in fact, in a lot of the stories in the text today in Mark's gospel, Jesus asks people, uh, more or less, which is more important. In the first instance, there's a man whose hand he can't use. We don't know if it was burned or if he was born with his hand so that he couldn't use his hand. But they were in church. And on church days in Jesus' time, you couldn't do any work. You, you weren't supposed to, at least some people said, you weren't even supposed to help somebody to heal them. And so Jesus asked the man to come forward, and he, he said, which is more important to the people who said, this is church, you can't be healing somebody in church. He said, which is more important, praying and singing hymns or healing this man's hand? What do you think praying is more important? this man's hand. Okay, I think that's what Jesus said, too. And then some friends had a person who couldn't use their legs or their arms, a paraplegic. They were paralyzed? They were paralyzed, so they couldn't run or swim or eat with their own hands. So his friends, well, that's a great question, though. His friends, he had four friends, and they carried him, and they lowered him through the roof because there were so many people. They, they, they imagine, imagine if they dug a hole in the roof of the church. They lowered him down, and some people said, my roof, what are you doing to our church? And they said, you can't heal this man here. And what do you think Jesus said was more important? The man who was healing. Yeah, this man who they had brought. And so Jesus said, get up, take up your mat, and walk home. And guess what? He did. And he said, your sins are forgiven, which was really important because a man didn't see himself as having much value. And Jesus said, oh, yes, you have a lot of value in God's eyes. And the last one, his disciples were really hungry. They were starving. Have you ever been so hungry that you thought, oh, my gosh, I have to eat something right now? You're so hungry. And his disciples started to eat grain, but it was also on the Sabbath. And, again, you couldn't do any work on the Sabbath. You had to get your meals all ready the day before because you were supposed to rest the whole time. Could you imagine on the day you, you don't do any work at all, including picking little grains? So they were eating them. And so people say, uh, 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 we don't care how hungry you are, you are breaking the rules. And what do you think Jesus said? What was more important, that they could fill their stomachs when they were starving and really hungry, or abiding by those rules so strictly, even if it meant they couldn't eat? Getting fed. That's right. So in all those cases, just like the safety belt and not cheating on tests, Jesus was saying, see the person in front of you and the love that God has for them is more important than sometimes being so strict and so self-assured and holy, holier than another person that you look down on them and say, I'm sorry, I can't help you today because today I have to pray or today I have to sing. Jesus said, now wait a minute. What's more important, the prayer or the action of the prayer? It doesn't mean we shouldn't pray or we shouldn't sing hymns or we shouldn't be holy in church. 
And Jesus says, don't miss the people in front of you who are in need right now. And don't think it's so important that you can't help right now the person in need. Consider which is more valuable, okay? So when you see somebody, what's in, what, 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 do we, what should we do then when we see somebody and we're busy, maybe we're on our way to church, maybe we're running late, not that anybody knows today, and we see somebody outside who looks lonely. Should we run right, right past them and go into church? No. Not say anything? No. Pretend they're not there? No. What do you think? What could we do? What, what could you do instead of running past them? You could ask them if they need anything. You could smile. You can sit down and with your mom and dad or, or with grandma and hello. grandpa, talk to them. You could say, hello, how are you? Are you okay? And take time for each other, right? So I want you to think, sometimes we're in such a hurry or we're so worried about our schedules that we don't take time to really think about what's important right in front of us. All right? So I want you to think about that as you're going through your week. Think about it as you meet each person how God might see them and how we can try and see them the same way God does, okay? What's really important? Let's pray together, boys and girls. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls. Thank you. Please join in singing verse 2 of Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me still today, walking with me on my way, wanting as a friend to give light and love to all who live. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Good morning. This morning's reading is from the second chapter of Mark, verses 2 through 12. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many were gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door. And he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and after having dug through it, they let him down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves, and he said to them, Why do you raise such questions in your heart? Which is easier to say than the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Stand up and take your mat and walk? but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You're broken down and tired of living life on the merry-go-round. 
and you can't find the fighter, but I see it in you, so we gon' walk it out and move mountains. We gon' walk it out and move mountains, and I'll rise up, I'll rise like the day. Please join with me in prayer. O mover of mountains, breaker of chains, mover of stones over graves that are sealed, you who would rise up and lift us out of places of pain and brokenness, despair and hopelessness, places where we see ourselves in ways that are distorted from the way you see us. 
the truths we are convinced about ourselves that aren't true at all. O great Redeemer, giver of life, our everything, our God, we ask you to meet us where we are this Sunday in July. Meet us in our thoughts about family and friends. Meet us in our places of insecurity and discomfort over those that we are struggling with, relationships that we don't feel good about. And help us to rise to new beginnings in grace, in hope, and your amazing love. In the name of Christ, Jesus our Lord, we pray. Amen. The place is packed. Packed to the gills. People arm in arm. I mean, I imagine, you know, trying to go, whether you're in college, maybe you're in a bar scene, you're trying to fit through and you can't shoulder through people, or you're at a concert, or you're waiting in line at a, at a stadium attire, a game, and it, there's just a mass of humanity around. After all, in this case, word has spread that Jesus of Nazareth, this amazing preacher who has also done some healing and cast out demons, is at the home of Peter's in-laws in Capernaum again. And just like today, if, if, if I said or we heard or read somewhere that the risen Christ was preaching at the Williams house or the Costanzi house or the Johnson house, even if by curiosity, I mean, we'd be skeptical, right? But wouldn't you be curious I mean, knowing what we know about Jesus in, in our Christian faith, my God, it might be quite a crowd. At that time, people saw him as the Messiah, as this amazing prophet, perhaps as something more. But as this large crowd was gathered in, some inside the house, some outside, there's a pushing and jostling in the back. And as people turn around to see what's going on, they notice these four guys carrying somebody, a man, who can't get up on a stretcher. Excuse me, pardon me. Do you think we could get in there? And you tend to think that, okay, people's humanity will prevail. Of course. I mean, clearly this man's in distress. We can, can we clear a path? But then, you know, part of me thinks, okay, that's, that's a human reaction. Yes, we're going to let this man, this man who's clearly disabled through. But then I also think, in my human self, I'm at Disney World and we're waiting on Peter Pan line for like an hour and a half and somebody rolls up with a wheelchair and then I see them get up and just walk to the ride <laughs> and suddenly my skepticism and cynicism kind of creeps in. I think, well, maybe I'll just keep my spot. In any case, they don't let the man through, the crowd. And you think, well, the friends, maybe they could do something a little different. Maybe they, it's like showing up at your favorite restaurant and they say, oh, I'm sorry, we got an hour and a half wait, no reservations. Maybe we can come back later. But these people who are carrying him persist. No, we have to get our friend to this man. We'll get some rope, we'll bring him up to the roof, we'll cut a hole, and we'll lower him down. I want us to sit with that for a minute. Because this, this text really I could preach three or four sermons on. I think of all the characters in this scene. We have Jesus, of course. We have the man on the mat. We don't know, was he paralyzed from birth? Has he always been dependent on somebody to lift him from his bed, to feed him his meals, to bathe him? Has he known nothing else? Or has he been a vibrant young man? who could, you know, run and swim and, and light up a room and suddenly some tragic thing happened to him. A wreck, diving accident, whatever it may be, and suddenly everything that he knew, all the things he was able to do, it's over. Because I know there's a lot of people that can relate to that kind of thing. Maybe you're not paralyzed. But we have friends who have diagnosis with rheumatoid arthritis and there's some days they can't get out of bed. We have friends who are crippled by depression, so severe that they don't want to leave the house. We have daughters that are in relationships with uh, young men who are emotionally or physically abusive and we keep saying, honey, get out of there. 
What are you doing? But we can't make her leave, and she's stuck. We have young men and women who are hooked on opioids, and we watch them steal, lie, cheat, doing whatever they can to battle this addiction, and we watch them become something that they're they're not the shining person we knew. They're, they're a shadow, a shell of who they were, and they're stuck. And we watch people who have accidents, physical accidents, cancer, and, and, and illnesses that cripple what they have been once able to do. And these friends, these family members, some of you here, sometimes ask the question, why? Why is this happening to me? What did I do, God, that you're punishing me for this? The text about the paralytic seems to lend to that kind of interpretation based on what we'll hear Jesus does in just a minute. It's not a healing story, folks. I know some of our Bibles, you go back and read it, and it's a healing of the paralytic. But it's primarily not a healing story. More about that in a second. So we have the paralytic. Who is he? What got him there? Where's his faith? He doesn't say anything in this text at all. Did you see? He, he says nothing. He speaks nothing to Jesus. He only picks up his mat and leaves when Jesus tells him to. Back to that in a second. Then we've got the, the owner of this house, uh, Peter's mother-in-law and father-in-law. I can just p- picture old man uh, Peter, Peter's father-in-law. My house! My house! Kind of Clark Griswold with the Christmas tree after his uncle smoking. What did you do to my roof? Right? I mean, just imagine, all right, an Easter Sunday. Place is crowded. Suddenly you hear some, you know, some power saws all up there. And, and some debris. I know some of you count the tiles when the sermons go long, but some debris falling down. And suddenly, you know, you see some sunlight and some dark silhouettes of people and then this object coming down. And then, like, Deus et Machina coming down, this paralyzed man and Jesus talking. What the heck is going on? Right? I mean, his friends are, we're going to get her done either way. We're going up to the roof. You're not going to stop us. And we got these friends. Again, I want to sit with this for a second. Who know that their humor to try and break their friend out of depression or feeling down into despair about his paralysis, well wishes, inspiring quotes or books, whatever it is they try to do to lift his spirits is not enough. And they know it's not enough. And they know they have to do whatever they can to connect him to Jesus. Because they believe he will be enough. There's power in that. Then you have these scribes. Now, who are the scribes? Scribes are people who spend their lives being paid to copy the text of Torah and Scripture. They're professional writers of Scripture, but they're not just hired hands. They are also appointed by the synagogue, by the temple, by the church, because they're holy men. You have to be a person of high moral character to be a scribe, and you have to be approved by the priests. So they are selected church folks who are doing this very holy task of not making, hopefully, no errors. And they understand the scriptures. They know it by heart. So these men lower in front of the crowd this paralyzed man. And Jesus says something to him. What does he say? Does he start with get up and walk out of here? No. He says, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now let's take a time out there. You didn't do anything. You're not being punished by God. God didn't smite you with paralysis. All that stuff you're caring about yourself, all the ways that you're saying you're not worth anything, that God is punishing me, that I've done something wrong, that some sins I have done have created this, as many people believe, 
I say to you, your sins are forgiven. God doesn't see you that way. Let me take that off of you. The biggest healing that takes place is a paralysis of the soul, not the body. You are God's son. You are a child of the light. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. Nothing that you've carried in here today that you're beating yourself up about, nothing that you still hold against yourself that you have not forgiven yourself for, do I want you to carry anymore? Now, there's a couple of us in here today who have longed for Jesus to say that to us, who have longed to hear it, or maybe more powerfully have longed to believe it because we can't forgive ourselves. No hands, but does that include you today? When you think about your relationship with God, you go through, but back 10 years ago when I did this, Boy, do I wish I hadn't done that. Jesus says, by the grace of God, you're forgiven. That's where this story starts. That Jesus has the authority to forgive you. The scribes, the churchy folks say, mm-mm, 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 mm-mm. We're not having any of this. No, sir. And in their hearts, they don't say anything. That wouldn't be proper, right? Good church folks, we're not going to say that anything. Especially in the Midwest, we're not going to say anything. Who does this guy think he is? Now, I want you to see the contrast, like we talked about in the children's message. After this whole thing goes down, people in the crowd say, we've never seen anything like this. Did you see what just happened? He forgave this man's sins, and then he told him to get up and walk out of here. What's more important? The scribes are over in the corner thinking, blasphemy. Only God can do what he's doing. Who does he think he is, quite literally? And Jesus, because it's often in Mark's gospel, Jesus kind of thinking what people are feeling, calls them out on it. What's easier to do? Say to this man that his sins are forgiven, or say to him, pick up your mat, stand up, and walk out of I'm like, yeah, <laughs> go for it. Be our guest. Get up, pick up your mat, and go home. And he does. And they're stunned. But if you look at the text of the paralytic, can I encourage you to go home? Read Mark 1 and 2 together. Read those chapters together. And you'll see that story after story is about what's more important. The man with a crippled hand. In worship, on a Sabbath, Jesus wants to heal him. The man wants to be healed, but he feels the Pharisees and the scribes in church saying, this guy's going to heal on the Sabbath. He's going to break the law. And Jesus, it says, temple when he turns the tables isn't the only time, it says Jesus gets angry. What is more important? That we keep strict, rigid rules on the Sabbath or that this man finds the kingdom of God and has use of his hand and is made whole again? What's more important? That my disciples are feeding their starving hunger or they broke the Sabbath? What's more important, that this man hears for the first time that it's not your fault. You didn't do anything wrong to be paralyzed. It was either an accident or it's just part of life. God isn't punishing you. God loves you. Even at times when you can't love yourself or you say, what is it that's worth living for in this life? Because there's a lot of folks in our lives that are in that place. Why am I even here? What's the point? In their brokenness, in their pain. 
You're forgiven and you're loved. And you're not alone. And these guys, these scribes, continue to conspire about Jesus as he continues to break through all the social norms and the social mores and what's proper. And I think this is the other place that this text preaches. When institutions like the temple or the synagogue, because here's what Jesus is really doing. The scribes are not only concerned that Jesus says your sins are forgiven, but that Jesus is breaking their rules, their system. Here's how their system worked. If you were a paralyzed man, you couldn't just go to a healer and be healed like Jesus is healing this guy in Peter's in-law's house. No, 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 no. You have to go to the temple according to the law. You have to show yourself to a priest. The priest has to receive from you some kind of sacrifice saying you're sorry for whatever sins led you to this place that you need healing. You hear? You have to give a sacrifice to atone for whatever sins you committed that made you where you're at today. Whether it's, you know, you cheated on somebody, you told a lie, you killed somebody, you became blind, you lost a hand, physical, emotional, spiritual. Whatever it was, bring the sacrifice, the priest will look it over. If it's good enough and you get better, you're forgiven. If the priest says you're forgiven, you're forgiven. But guess what? If it doesn't get better, if it's a physical ailment and it doesn't get better, guess who the problem's with? Is it with God? Mm -mm. It's still you. Your heart must not be in the right place. Your offering must not have been good enough. It's on you. You're the reason that God still is not blessing you. I want you to hear again what Jesus says. You're forgiven. You don't have to go to the priests. You don't have to bring a sacrifice. You don't have to go to the temple. God forgives you without any of that stuff because you're a son or daughter of the living God and because of who God is. Not because of what anybody else says. Not because of how good your gift is. Just because God says, I love you. Period. Exclamation point. This is something neither he nor the crowds had ever heard before. And something that made the scribes angry. Why? Because it's cutting them out. What do you mean you don't have to go to the temple? What do you mean you don't have to have the priest bless this healing? Grumble, grumble, grumble. And so they start to plot to kill him. So, what's more important? What's more important? The building? The parking lot? Whether or not we make budget? Or the people? The people who are hurting here? And the people out there? Jesus says, Make sure you know what's important, what matters most. This isn't, again, this isn't a story about healing, per se. It's about who has the authority to make us free. Yes, he got up and walked. But maybe the greater healing was that he didn't feel that God didn't have time for him anymore. That he didn't feel like somehow something was wrong with who he was, how he was made, how he was created. There was a God who knew him by name. And when Jesus looked him in the eyes and said, hey, God hasn't given up on you. Don't you give up on you. You're forgiven. Their friends, his friends, trusted Jesus enough to bring him no matter what the risk it leads me to wonder who in our lives, who in our friends, might need us to take a few risks to help find their wholeness and their connection, even beyond what you and I can give as friends. 
and the peace of Christ, the source of all kinds of healing. Amen. And now as we gather together our hearts and prepare for prayer, let's have a little silent time and listen for what God is speaking to you and trust that you are being heard. Let's pray. God, when we think about the gifts that you give to us that are so freely given, the gifts of mercy and forgiveness and love, the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, the people that you have placed in our lives, quite frankly, Lord, sometimes it is overwhelming to us, hard for us to accept that there is nothing that we did to get that stuff from you. And there is nothing that we can do that will cause you to take it away. It's hard to take, Lord. Us and our human conditions who so easily blame ourselves or one another for the things that go wrong. And too often credit our own abilities as the reason that we are so fortunate. We forget that the gifts that you have given us, the abilities that you have given us, are meant to flow out into the world so they can flow into one another and back to you again. We forget in our lowest moments that you are always there for us, that your love is truly steadfast, that your forgiveness is truly free, and that your mercies are indeed new every morning. We thank you for the gift of friendship. And we pray that we can be the kind of friends that our friends need. We pray that when we need forgiveness, that we can seek it, and that we can humble ourselves to receive it. And that when we hurt someone, they will respond to us with your mercy so that our relationship can be repaired. And when we are hurt by someone, Lord, help us not to hold on to that, but to release it to you who can hold every hurt so that we can be full and whole again. Giving grace, receiving grace. Giving love, receiving love. And giving your mercy and receiving it back again. And as we leave this place today, dear God, keep us in your sights. Make us aware of your presence so that we might look upon those we meet, both those we know and those we don't know, with your eyes so that we can know that all of us are broken in one way or another, that we can have patience with those who seem to be impatient and only caring about themselves, that instead of responding in anger that we might respond in love. All of these things, Lord, we pray in your name. And we ask a special prayer on that family and those families that were killed in that boating accident. Came together to have just a great time with one another, to reconnect, to grow in love. And when tragedies like that happen, Lord, help us to remember that you are not the author of death. You are, rather, the author of life. And that of of every single life we have, 
your gift is only more life. We give you ourselves this day, Lord, once again. Receive us into your presence and guide us in your ways. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. As we come to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the time of our offering, I've been thinking a lot about flow lately and how all the gifts of God are meant to flow out into the world and through us into one another. All those gifts, our money, our resources, our, our talents, every single one of them was given to us by God. The work that we do, the money that we make, God has enabled that to happen so that we might freely give to others as we have been freely given to. So as the ushers come forward this morning and you deposit all your resources that you have this day into those plates, knowing that they will be used by this church and beyond, also remember that you yourself are a resource to be used here and beyond. The ushers can come forward. me up. 
please rise. God, indeed you do raise us up to more than we can be. Continue to stretch us and grow us. Bless us and bless these gifts. Make them more than we think that they are going to be. And show us how they can be used. To your work in the world, to gift one another here, and to bring about the peace and the harmony that your vision is. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now our last song for the day will be number 708, Go Forth for God. In picking the hymns, I'll make sure we get that go forth in joy when the song feels like we're going forth in joy. I, sometimes, sorry. Right. Well, anyway, if that's your favorite hymn, I'm sorry. We can talk in the parlor here. Thank you for visiting with us today, if you're visiting. And one of the closing traditions we have at the church is to join hands with our neighbors to say that we are in this journey together. In times of trouble, in times of struggle, in times of joy, that we don't want to just walk alone, but with Christ and with one another, as we sing our closing benediction.
The reality is that most of us haven't experienced a miraculous healing like the paralytic story. But we know plenty of friends who feel broken. Sometimes we feel broken ourselves or despair, hopelessness. I hope the one thing that we remember is that we are created to be a people of hope, a people of purpose centered in the love of Christ, which does move mountains, changes and transforms life, and hopefully changes who you and I are as we carry that message out from this place. So may the love of Christ live within you deeply and richly, and may you not leave it here, but may it be the thing you carry with you every day. Go in peace. Thank you so much for joining us today. Before you head out, come on up and join us in our postlude, Let It Rise. Oh, 